Okay, this morning we're continuing on the parable of the sower. So two weeks ago before the anniversary, we covered the first two scenarios. So today we're going to cover the uh, next two scenarios, which is the seed among the thorns and then the seed on good ground, which became fruitful. So let's just go to the different passages. Um, first of all, and we'll just read all three uh, when it comes to the thorns. So Matthew 13, 22, he said, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Uh, another one is in Mark 4. And you remember from two weeks ago, our position is, well, my position is, is that uh, of the four scenarios, only the first one represents a scenario where people are not saved and the other three represent saved people. Um, and, and now we're looking at what we can learn from these three different scenarios. So Mark 4, verse 18 and 19, it says here, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And we'll just look at the last one in Luke 8, 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Um, so we see here the, the seed among the thorns, that the thorns choked that word and it caused the word to become unfruitful. Now, before I get into what the parables represent and what is explained here and, and some things we can learn from it, um, I just wanted to... Touch briefly, uh, we'll go to Joshua, Joshua 3.13. Like what else um, can thorns represent in the Bible? Because sometimes people dispute over what thorns are and they think that it just has to be one thing. They'll say like it's either this or it's that and it, it's one or the other, it can't be both. But obviously God is using thorns in, as an illustration um, and you know thorns obviously have properties where you know they're dangerous they can hurt you they they entangle and choke and hold they they cause life to not grow you know they're difficult to get rid of you know if you want if you want to get rid of thorns the Bible talks about burning thorns and obviously if you burn thorns you're gonna burn the good crop as well so sometimes you have to start over just to get and purge out everything just to get rid of thorns so there's a lot of things that we can learn from thorns and God uses this analogy and uses this illustration to describe several things. They don't just, I don't believe they just represent just one thing throughout the whole Bible. It's just thorns are something, they have certain properties and certain things can be used, uh, th these can be used to illustrate uh, different things. Um, the first one here is in uh, Joshua 23, 13. I believe that thorns can represent ungodly people, ungodly people. Um, so in Joshua 23, 13, it says here, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. So if you remember, God told them to go into the promised land to drive out all the Canaanites and the Hittites and, the, uh, and all the different nations that dwelt in there. But he said, if you don't drive them all out, then they're going to be as thorns and pricks in your sides. And eventually they didn't drive them out. And then, then God said, well, now you're never going to drive them out. You know, now even if you try and drive them out, they're always going to be there. Um, and this is where we come to in Joshua 23. It says, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. So there's that entangling that, uh, that thorns have. They, they, they keep you where you don't want to be. And scourges in your sides, there's the damage that they can do. And thorns in your eyes, so even they, they stop you from seeing clearly. Thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Second Samuel says here, But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. So again, thorns there, or the sons of Belial being likened to thorns and saying that the thorns are going to be gathered up and um, cast away. Um, which, which is what God will do with the ungodly and the unbeliever um, at judgment. Um, a couple of other things that you may not have thought about. Um, 2 Corinthians 12. This is a famous passage where Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh. Now there's a lot of discussion over what that thorn in the flesh is. A lot of people think 
that it is a it is a, a sickness that Paul had and saying a thorn in the flesh like there was something wrong with his body. Um, I'm not against that interpretation. I personally believe that the thorn in the flesh is a person. Um, and I will just read it here in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So Paul is saying here, uh, you know, in case, in case I'm lifted up through all the knowledge that was given to me by extra revelation from Jesus Christ. He says, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So, you know, I think I think some people, you know, think, you know, is 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 it a is it a sickness or something like that? Because they because he asks in verse eight that it might depart from me. But we know that people, you know, the Holy Spirit is a person, but it's also referred to as an it as well. And, and if he's using the illustration that it's a thorn, he can refer to the thorn as an it, even though the it could be a person. Um, another thing is, uh, they might say, uh, what did it say? When it talks about in verse 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So again there, he talks about his infirmities, but in verse 10 he also says, therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So I, I do think that there is a strong case for it being a sickness, so I'm not, I'm not against that. The reason why I believe it's a person is because it says here in verse 7, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So when I see somebody as a messenger, I mean, a, a sickness is not really a, a it doesn't really give you a message, does it? It's not really bringing you some sort of, sort of message as a messenger. So I actually think it's a, a person, and, and it's this person that, you know, is persecuting Paul and is buffeting him and is making his life hard. And I suppose it's, you know, maybe because if somebody has all these revelations from Jesus Christ, their head can be lifted up with pride. But if they have enemies, then they're constantly reminded that not everybody loves them. Um, not everybody um, thinks that they're a blessing. And um, so that's a thought there. Um, so I think that it could be interpreted two ways. Uh, I wanted to show you this here, um, Exodus 22. I'll give you a thought here. Now, this is not a verse that shows that thorns are people, but just when I went to this verse, I had this thought, and I don't know if you guys have ever read this verse and had this thought as well, but I just wanted to share it with you. But in Exodus 22, 6, this is one of the laws in Exodus of, of one, uh, how to govern. Um, but it says here, If fire break out and catch in thorns, so that the stacks of corn or the standing corn or the field be consumed therewith, he that kindleth the fire shall surely make restitution. So the Bible's saying here that if some, somebody has a field and then there's thorns and somebody like lights those thorns on fire and they catch on fire, but then they accidentally also catch the, the field of corn on fire, it's saying here that whoever started that fire ought to make restitution, ought to pay back and make good the, all the corn that was also burnt as well. And obviously this is a civil law saying, you know, if, if there's a, somebody that's committed a crime and, and ruined somebody's field, that we should find out who that person is and they should be responsible for all that corn that is lost. But just, just keeping in mind that, you know, thorns are an illustration of people, I just had this thought, and I don't know if you guys can sort of see this too, that th this is almost like a picture of the end times. You know, where, you know, even though in this illustration it's a criminal making, making a fire and burning the thorns and the corn, I just wonder whether that's a picture of God one day, He's going to kindle a fire, isn't He? he he's going to kindle a fire. And you know, the Bible talks about all the things of the earth that shall melt with fervent heat and all these things are going to be burnt up. Um, but if the corn is burnt as well, He's going to make restitution because even if in that physical fire of the earth burning up, obviously believers are going to get caught up in that fire as well in, their, in the fleshly sense, but because they're saved, because they're the corn and not the thorns, God will give them a new body. God will make restitution. Um, I don't know if that's uh, uh, right, but that's just something I thought about when I read that verse. I just wonder whether there's that application there. 
um, how that verse, how this passage might have a spiritual meaning to it. Now, what else can thorns represent? If we go to Genesis three seventeen, um, the other, the obvious one is it represents the curse. Um, I don't know if you guys know this. For those of you maybe newer in the faith, but Genesis three seventeen it says, and unto Adam he said. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And look at this. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return." I guess it's always hard for us to imagine a world without sin, a world without pain, without sorrow. You know, people often have the thought, you know, did you, could you stub your toe in the Garden of Eden? Wouldn't that hurt? I mean, could some, is it possible that somebody could have an accident in the Garden of Eden and die? You know, how, how does that work? You know, would you just fall over and would it not hurt? You wouldn't bruise and things like that. I, who knows, right? Uh, but I do believe that when God restores the new earth, it'll be similar, or if not exactly the same as the Garden of Eden. He's going to restore or things to perfection. But obviously when, when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree and a curse came upon the world, one of the things that happened is the ground brought forth thorns and thistles and man would have to till and take care of the ground. It didn't just bring forth its fruit easily anymore. Um, so we see here that thorns and thistles uh, are a representation of the curse um, brought into the world because of sin. And we won't go to the passage in John, but just one verse in Matthew, uh, sorry, Matthew 27, verse 29. Uh, this is why we believe that when Jesus was crowned with the crown of thorns, that it represented him being made a curse for us. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So it's always interesting in the Bible how, you know, when you, when you read through the Gospels and you read through how things pan out, that, you know, this is just, this is just obviously the Romans. They probably just thought it was funny just to, to create this crown because obviously uh, he was being accused of being king of the Jews. You know, so obviously they make this painful crown and they put it on him. But isn't it funny that they don't realize that it's part of God's plan, that he was crowned with thorns, the spiritual significance of the thorns and the fact that, you know, Christ is the king and he was, he was, the thorns were put on him and he was made a curse for us. Um, that's one of the interesting things about um, the stories in the Bible. So we can see here that thorns can represent ungodly people. Uh, they can, it represents the curse. Um, but let's go into what they actually represent in... Um, in the parable, so we'll go to um, let's go to the let's go to the passage in Mark. They're all pretty similar. Um, pretty much in Matthew, uh, it just talks about the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. So just the first two, and then we read in Mark and Luke the lust of other things or the pleasures of this life. So we'll just go through one at a time. Mark has all um, has all three of them uh, in verse uh, eighteen. Let's go there. 18, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So what, do care, what, what are cares of this world? I mean, cares of this world in my mind, and you know, I'm not saying that this is a totally exhaustive sermon, so I'm not going to give like every single example of, of the things, three things listed here. But when I think of cares of this world, I think of worry and stress. You know, things that worry you, things that, things that take up your mind, things that you think about and, and get you away from thinking about the things of God or, you know, even studying the Word of God because you're too busy doing other things. Um, so worry and stress. And one thing about cares of this world um, is they're often, often they're self-inflicted, aren't they? You know, either it's because, you know, you are thinking about it too much or you are not trusting God to, to, to take care of things for you. You know, one thing that a, a, a friend told me in, in Mexico was, you know, if, if you could do something about it, then do it and you don't have to worry about it. But if you can't do something about it, then you can't do anything about it anyway. So why worry about it? So there's never a reason to worry that you either do what you need to do to fix the problem or you have to trust God that he will um, work things all for good. So often these are self-inflicted. I mean, some examples are, you know, our 
our finances. You know, generally it's our own fault why we get into financial trouble. Uh, you know, or you know, even even if it comes to losing a job, if that's not our fault. I mean, you know, often you know we we have to be responsible as adults, right? If you don't have sort of a buffer that if you lose your job, you can transition from one job to another, or you know, you're comfortable in this job and you're not learning any skills, you're getting lazy, and then you get made redundant and you don't have any other skills to market yourself and get another job. I mean, who, who's to blame for that? You know, you can't blame your employer for that. You can't, you know, you can't be like these socialist, you know, left-wing people that just think the state owes them a living. Everyone owes them a living, and that's why, you know, that's why all these laws get passed. Minimum wage. You know, you have to have this this leave and maternal leave, and paternal leave. But you know, if a company wants to do these things, that's fine. You know, they can they can give out these things as an incentive for people to work for their company. But I believe it's morally wrong to use the government to force a company to, to give you all these things, to give you a pay rise. I mean, if you, if you want a pay rise, you need to work harder. You need to, you need to be worth more. And then uh, somebody will, uh, to, will pay you more. Um, you can't just force somebody to, to earn more. And a lot of people don't really understand this concept. And this is not, a, obviously, a sermon about capitalism. But you just have to understand the concept because most of us are employees. We think, hey, you know, our employer should pay for our insurance. They should pay for this. They should pay for that. They should pay for our social, uh, our, our um, uh, superannuation and, and give us this maternal leave and paternal leave. Um, but we don't realize that, you know, em employers, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are buying a, a good and a service off you. So it's like, it would be like the government, you know, you, you go out and buy an iPhone, right? And, and they cost $900. It'd be like the government forcing you to pay $2,000 just because you know, they're taking care of the, of the business and saying, well, how is that business meant to make money? How are they meant to take care of themselves? You should be paying them more. It's no different when you're an employee. You're selling your service, and nobody should force that person to pay more than, than what is uh, freely negotiated. Um, that, that's my view on those things. But anyways, a lot of these things are self-inflicted. So when it comes to you know, finances, uh, job, and, and, and your business, uh, maybe it's health related, you know, like if you don't take care of your health and you don't look after your body and then you get cancer or you get diabetes, I mean, you know, th this, these are, these are self-inflicted issues. I mean, obviously we don't live in a perfect world and, you know, our bodies don't work the way it should. So there are obviously legitimate ways. I'm not saying they're always self-inflicted, but often the ones that we experience, they are, if you, if you sort of look at the, in your own life. Um, you know, relationships. You know, not, not taking care of your marriage and not, not um, you know, thinking about your relationship with your wife and doing that sort of stuff can cause you a lot of worry and a lot of stress. Um, what about bad friends? You know, friends that get you, get you doing things you shouldn't. You know, you care about what they think um, or a job and a business. You know, you, you, you think of other examples, but just things that take your mind away from the Word of God and things that take your mind away from doing the will of God. My phone just crashed on me. Okay, so that's the cares of this world. Let's look at the second one. So we say, see here, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. So we have the cares of this world, the worry and the stress, and the deceitfulness of riches. So people that are using their life just to be rich you know the bible talks about that they that will be rich fall into a snare and into diverse and many um lusts and things like that um but why why does the bible talk about riches um being deceitful well a couple of thoughts there is you know often they deceive us because you know you think it's going to make you happy you think that's going to be the source of your joy and your happiness you know, like even when we look at the story of Solomon, Solomon had all the riches and all the power. You know, his conclusion after he, he exhausted all the lusts that he had was fear God and keep his commandments. But even sometimes I, you know, you get the thought that, you know, well, if I was in that situation, I would have handled it differently. You know, like I, would have, I would have come to a different conclusion or I would have used those riches differently or something like that. But, uh, you know, don't be, don't be foolish in that sense. Obviously, if, if Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived and he came to that conclusion, take a lesson from that. Don't think that you can uh, do better than, uh, than Solomon. So you think it's going to make you happy. You think it's going to make you more stable. But, you know, it's, that's deceitful, right? Because people that are rich, that, that's not the source of their happiness. 
You know, riches don't make you happy. Riches don't even make you stable because you could, you could lose it all uh, you know, in, a, in a brief moment of time. I mean, all, all it would take is for your health to disintegrate and what are your riches, where are your riches going to go? Um, they're just all going to go into the medical system. Um, why, why deceitful? Because you think you don't have enough. You know, the deceitfulness of riches is, you know, you think you need more when you don't. I mean, especially for us in this country, and for us in this church, I mean, all of us are comfy. All of us have enough money. If you think you need more money, you're deceived. You don't need more. You've got enough um, to live more comfortably than you know, probably 90% of the world. Um, you think it's what's most important for your children. You know, so people will, will you know, spend so much time you know, making money, buying things for their children and thinking that's what's most important as opposed to your time being more important for your children and spending time with them and teaching them. Um, so you think it's what's most important for your children. Uh, money is not what's most important for your children. You know, often when I talk to people at work and I tell them, oh, you know, I've got four kids and they're like, oh, crazy, how can you afford them? Well, they don't cost that much money. You know, and if you think that that's what children need, like the children need, you know, their own room, their own bed, their own iPad, their own car, you know, the, I mean, do you need to spend all this money on them? I mean, yeah, if you can afford it, I'm not saying it's wrong, but all I'm saying is, you know, pe people who are a lot poorer than us, with a lot more children than us, have raised children that, you know, are responsible and, 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 because you know, when they get old enough, they can earn their own living. You know, you're not going to pay, you don't pay for them and pay for their house and pay for their car. Like nobody paid for my car. Nobody's paying for my house. So, you know, uh, you, you don't have to think that children are, are, are that expensive and what they need is money. What they need is, that what they need is their parents. You know, that's why you don't want to just stick them in a daycare. You don't want to just send them off to school because they, they need you to nurture, to train and nurture them in the admonition of the Lord and to bring them up. Um, and somebody else is not going to do that with the same love and fervency as you, you should be doing. Um, so you think it's what's most important for your children. Um, or for some people, you think it's more important than children. Do you know what I mean? Because some people will forego children to, to go out and make money. And I think you're deceived if that's the case. Because children are obviously a lot more valuable than money. And if somebody thinks, well, I'm going to forego having children to make more money, uh, that's just... Uh, a sad situation, I think, that you don't realize the value of people and the value of children. Um, another thing, a way that riches can deceive people, you know, you think it can replace soul winning. You think it can replace serving in a church. You think it can replace your service to the Lord. Because some people say, well, I'm just going to work and I'm just going to give to the work of the Lord and, and, and they can go out and do the work. Hey, obviously there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that there's something right and something wrong. I'm just saying that doesn't replace your service for the Lord. Because there's ways that God wants to use you um, who donate to charitable organizations. There's, God, there's ways that God wants to use you and people that God can, can reach with you. It, it, I mean, it's even out, even out soul winning when we talk to people. I mean, different personalities, we know this, get different results. You know, somebody that I talk to at the door, maybe like an older gentleman, may not want to listen to me because I look young, you know, and they think, oh, you know, what does this youngster know? But if, if an older person went out soul winning, one of the adults and, and the older generation went out soul, soul winning, maybe they would listen to that person, right? Like an older man might listen to an older person. And, you know, is that a, is that a valid objection to the gospel? No, but we just know this is just human nature. You know, maybe a female at the door will listen to a female. You know, whereas maybe if a man talks to a Muslim woman, they won't, it won't have as much effect as if a woman talks to another woman and, and preaches them the gospel. So don't think that money and your resources can replace what you can do for the Lord, what you can do in the local church. It's like somebody giving to a local church and yeah, great, church has resources, church has equipment, church has a building, but they're never there. You know, that money is not going to replace the fellowship that they could provide. That money can't replace the friendship that they can provide. You know, that money can't replace the edification that they can receive from the church. You just, you know, money is not going to replace these things. And if somebody thinks they can, then obviously they're deceived. Another way it's deceitful is that you think money is, is worth trading your short life for. You know, when people, you know, that's, that's what they are focused on doing. They're focused on their career. You know, nothing wrong with career. Nothing wrong with a job. Nothing wrong with a business. But if that becomes your life, if that becomes your purpose, and you think that that's worth trading your life for, you're deceived. Because it's not worth it. 
You know, you, you have a higher calling to win people to the Lord and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ if you think your purpose here is to trade your life just for a job, for money, um, you're deceived. Proverbs 23.5 Look at this, this proverb. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Now you can't bring your riches to heaven. So, you know, if you think your life is worth trading riches for, um, that's why riches are deceitful. All right, let's go back to Mark uh, and look at the last one. Mark 4, what is it? Mark 4, 19. Cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Now, the last one in the thorns is the lust of other things and the pleasures of this life. Um, we'll see there in Luke oh, Luke 8, 14. So here it says, uh, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. In Luke 8, 14, it's said a little different. It says it's choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Now, when it comes to the lusts of other things and pleasures of this life, I've got a couple of thoughts here for you this morning. Um, one is the, that lusts can be things, obviously, when we think about being materialistic and materialism, but it can also be people, right? The lust of other things, like the lust of other women, the lust of other men. And, you know, it's like one of those things, you know, how many times do you see, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this in your Christian life, where people are faithful in church. They're going along to church, they're learning, they're growing, they're going soul winning, and then they get involved with the wrong person. You know, they get in involved with a, with a lady that's not saved or a man that's not saved, and it, because the desire is there to want to be with somebody. The desire is there to want to be with the opposite uh, gender. But then it, 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 it's a thorn in their life because it takes them away from the word and it prevents them from being fruitful. Because how many people have you seen hook up with somebody and then they get out of church or they just start going downhill from that point onwards? You know what? And if you make it a point to help that other person or encourage that other person to serve the Lord with you, probably one of two things are going to happen. Either one, they're going to start serving the Lord with you or they're going to start coming along to church and start growing um, because if they want to be with you, that's just something they're going to have to accept and maybe they'll get one somewhere along the, on, along the way. Or the other side of the coin is, is that they won't want to be with you anymore. You know, if you're dating this person, they, they, you know, probably you won't get along as much as you, as much as you ought and, and that will lead and guide that, the direction of that relationship in the way that it probably... Um, should go if you're dating an unbeliever um, and you know it always it always boggles my mind when uh, you know somebody that's zealous for the Lord you know they they skip church or they skip church functions to go spend time with their unsaved girlfriend or even it doesn't have to be unsaved unsaved girlfriend unsaved boyfriend or just even if they're saved and they're just not living for the Lord because you, don't you think like why, why do you make that compromise like, like why, why like why does the person that's in church make the compromise say oh, I'm gonna compromise to, to go and spend time with that person. Why isn't it the other way around? Why don't they compromise, you know, and come to do the right thing rather than you compromise and do the wrong thing? So, you know, I think, you know, you need to, you want to stake people that are in that situation. They want to, they need to, you know, sort of put their stake down and, and um, make a stand. And, and that'll, I think, lead and guide that relationship in the way it ought to go because it'll either go the right way or the wrong way and um, it'll help that that way. So lust can be things, um, it can also be people, you know, we see that a lot where people get out of church because they, I mean, it could be friends as well, um, they get out of church because they hang around with the wrong people. You know, don't fill your life with so much fun that you neglect to serve the Lord. You know, there's nothing wrong with having fun, but if it's so filled with fun and social activities that you don't have time for church, you don't have time for the work of God, you've got too much fun in your life. Um... Think about the hours people spend uh, watching movies, you know, watching, watching series, right? Whether it's cartoon series or whether it's dra drama series or action series, uh, playing computer games or console games, uh, even Facebook games, you know, spending time on social media, uh, doing things like that. Uh, or, or even playing sports, you know, sports can become a thorn where you're just spending too much time on it and it's choking the word and it's becoming unfruitful. 
And you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not coming on here hard on everyone because I don't understand the struggle. Obviously, there are thorns in my life as well. You know, I can understand how somebody can watch a series and want to like just watch one movie after another or one video after another because that's how they're designed, guys. I don't know if you get it. It's it's a bit like drugs, right? It, it, it's like if you don't start, you won't be addicted to it because. You know, sometimes you, you see somebody watching this series and you're just like, that's the stupidest series ever. Like, why would you want to watch like Days of Our Lives or Neighbours? And it's like, why are you watching that? It's because that video, th th those series, they're designed to hook people on. Because when they start watching it, they get to know the people and it's addictive in the sense, you know, you want to find out what happens. Because now you know the story, you know the people. But if you never start, if you never, st you know, once you finish that series, you know, that's the time to get off it. Because then you never, you never start the next one, then you don't care what happens throughout the season, and then you can just get that stuff out of your life. And believe me, I know that struggle, you know. Like, I, I used to watch things as well, and I thank God, like, I've, I've been able to cut it off now. Um, so I get, I get the struggle, you know, I get the struggle. Um, I get the struggle with games, you know. I mean, I'm a, I'm a young Asian guy, right? You know, we, we play computer games. We played computer games. You know, the LAN party, man, that was like the thing to do when you're in high school. Everyone bring their, you know, their desktop and their monitor. Well, yeah, we, we, we had LAN parties back in the day where you had the tower and the big CRT monitors, right? And, and people would bring like double CRT monitors on the kitchen table and you'd hook up like a LAN and, you, and we'd have cables running through the house and everything like that and it really... I just think, I can't believe the parents of those houses let us use the house for that, for that reason because we left it in such a mess. But, um, you, know, you know, I get it, right? I get how you can just waste time on these things. But, you know, that's why it's good to come to church and it's good to be around people that no, are no longer wasting their time doing these things because when you want to go waste your time doing these things, nobody's going to encourage you to do that. You know, because after, after church today, nobody's going to encourage you to go to the movies. Nobody's going to encourage you to go to the beach, right? Or go and play computer games. They're going to encourage you to go soul winning and get out there and preach the gospel because that's what's more important because we want to be fruitful. Um, we want to spend our time doing that. So, you know, hours spent doing all these things. Um, you know, what about holidaying? You know, a lot of time. But not only time spent holidaying, but money spent holidaying. You know, a lot of people spend a lot and a lot of money um, on holidays. <clears throat> Uh, and other social activities. Social activities, people do. You know, I'm not against social activities, but we definitely should not be spending and focusing on that more so than the work of soul winning. And I've got here, you know, food, drink. And, you know, I would include drugs into food and drink. You know, I think a lot of people come down, come down hard on drugs because they, they have a, a larger effect than food. But really, to me, it's no different to people neglecting their body for food. You know, people drink poison, people eat poison, people inhale poison. Um, the things you want to think about is, you know, is, is, it the, is it the best use of your money? And one thing that really boggled my mind about smoking was uh, how expensive it is. Right? Because I remember uh, you know, at work, a lady actually asked me to buy her a pack of cigarettes, not, not with my money. She, she gave me some money because she was on the phone. She's like, hey, can you run down to the, you know, those, those, those little mobile carriages that come past and they play the tune to tell everyone that they're there. So they come into the car park and then they sell coffee and snacks and cigarettes and things like that. So I said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go grab it for you if you want, just to do her a favor. And I didn't realize it was like a pack of cigarettes was like 30 bucks. Or something like that. It was like thirty dollars, and they get more expensive than that. And I asked her, like, how many packs do you smoke? And she's like, sometimes one or two packs a day. And I'm just like, oh man, that's a crazy amount of money. Like thirty dollars a day, man. I, I like stress over, like, you know, do I even want to spend thirty dollars a month on my mobile phone? Like, but if I was just gonna blow that on 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 a habit, or but, but even people that buy coffees, you know, so that's why I, I want to just equally come ha down hard on smoking. But same with coffee, right? I mean, people buy two, three coffees a day. It's like three, ten dollars a day just to drink a beverage. I'm just thinking, if you just if you just got into the habit of drinking water, you wouldn't have to spend all that money buying coffees, and you could put it into the work of the Lord. I mean, you could give it to somebody else that needs it more than you do. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could do with money. So. You know, that's why I don't just put drugs into this separate category. Yes, they have a bigger effect, but you could, it's the same with food, right? You could say, well, okay, smoking's addictive. Well, eating sugar is addictive and it's not good for you. Drinking coffee is addictive and that's not good for you. You can say, it, well, it wastes a lot of money. Well, you know, so, do, so does food. You know, people who are foodies and they go out and they eat, they like to do those things. 
that can waste a lot of money too. You can say it's damaging your body. Well, eating the wrong foods damage your body as well. So you see how I just put them all into the same category. So you just got to think about, you know, when I put something into my body, how is it affecting my body? How is it affecting my health? Is it the best use of my money? Is it the best use of my body? Um, and also what effect does it have on my body? If, it, if I'm no longer sober, if it's changing the way I behave, then obviously these are things that we can use to determine, hey, is this the best thing I should be doing? Because we should always be striving to do the best. And you know, the Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. So whilst you can't just say inhaling this thing or eating this thing or drinking this thing is a sin, but if you look at what it's doing to you, how it's using your money, what it's doing to your body, and you think, hey, this is not the best thing, this is not good what I'm doing, then to you it is a sin. Uh, that's one way we can uh, gauge what is right and what is wrong. Now, the thing with the three types of thorns is, you know, the, the, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, the pleasures of this life. An interesting thing to note is, sometimes it's hard to determine when something becomes a thorn because these, things, these three things can be all legitimate things. Right? Like it's, it's legitimate to have cares of, of this world, right? Like, like if you don't have any worry at all, I mean, you're probably not even human, right? Every, all, of us, all of us have concerns. All of us have things that, you know, sometimes stress us out because we're flesh, right? And, and sometimes things ought to concern us, right? Like, like Kevin preached about, like worry is not always a bad thing. Sometimes worry is an indicator for you to do something about it. So it's not necessarily wrong to have worry and to have cares. Um, it's not necessarily wrong to make a living, right? To, to go out and spend time making a living, making money. Um, it's not wrong to enjoy some things. It's not wrong to, to have time holidaying, to ha have time to enjoy some of the pleasures of this life. So what I'm getting at is, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that the three types of thorns, they involve legitimate things in our life. So... But that's why it's so easy to get carried away with them because we can make excuses. We can justify that, oh, you know, I'm doing this because this is what's required, but then it becomes a thorn in your life. So it's like a tree. Like a tree requires leaves, doesn't it? It, re it requires other things to be a tree. Like a tree can't just be just fruit. You know, a tree has branches, a tree needs fruits, a tree has leaves. Um, you know, a tree might have certain things that it requires to bring forth fruit. Um, but then, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if a plant or a garden is not taken care of, that's when the thorns so slowly grow up over time if it's not periodically checked in order to bear fruit. So this is what we need to do when it comes to the thorns in our life. You know, some of them are legitimate, but we need to periodically check them to make sure that they're not making us unfruitful, that they're not choking the word. So a question is, you know, when when do leaves become thorns? You know, like what, what, what's, how do we answer that question? When, when do leaves become thorns? Well, we see here in the parables that, uh, here, uh, let's read there, verse 14, and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard the word go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So one way we can judge whether or not something has become a thorn is because is it hindering you from being fruitful? Is it hindering you from being fruitful? Is it stopping you from doing the things you know you're capable of or you know that you ought to do? So it's when they start to be damaging, right? Because, you know, when I think of, uh, I had this illustration, you know, when thorns are left too long, that's when they actually become dangerous. Uh, if you think about bindies in the garden, right? Bindies are like a, a very famous uh, prickle that grows in grass. You know when bindies first start to sprout, they're soft, aren't they? They can't do any job. It's this little green bulb. You can see the spikes are there, but they're not hard yet. They don't hurt you. And, and that's the time to get rid of them because they're not going to hurt your fingers. They're easy to get out. Um, you know, their roots haven't gone deep yet. But what, when you leave them for too long and you neglect the garden, that's when they start to choke the grass. They start to take over the grass. They leave patches in your grass. Uh, if you step on them, they're going to hurt you. And those little furry things of that ball now become hard and actually can stick into your feet and can hurt you. So if we think of that in the natural world, we can think of that in our spiritual life as well. Like when, when, when do these pleasures, when does this, this worry, when does the, the deceitfulness of riches, when does it become 
a thorn? Well, it's because if you leave it too long and then it starts to make you unfruitful. So, how can you tell if you're among thorns as opposed to leaves? Because, you know, leaves help to create more fruit, right? So, sometimes it's good to take a rest, right? So, sometimes it's good to take a holiday, but you got to think, why do I take this holiday? Like, why do I need this rest? Why do I need this money? Well, the purpose ought to be to bring forth more fruit. So, this is what, what is needed in order to become more fruitful. They can help. So leaves help to create more fruit, but thorns um, cause you to be unfruitful. So another thought I have is, instead of looking at the thorns and thinking, are these thorns or not? Maybe you should look at the fruit and see, well, if I don't have any fruit in my life, then they are thorns, because the thorns is causing to me, me to become unfruitful. If I have fruit in my life, and when I do these things that are legitimate, I have more fruit in my life. It gives me more energy. It makes me more healthy. It, it makes me more refreshed so that I can serve God better. You know, I, I have this person in my life and now we're more effective in soul winning. You know, we, we strengthen each other in our faith. So you can see what's the effect of these things in your life. Are they causing you to become more fruitful? Then you can say, well, maybe they're just leaves and branches and things that are necessary to to, to give more fruit? Or are they taking away from your work from the Lord? Are they taking away from your fruitfulness? Um, that's one way you can think when you're trying to judge the thorns in your life. So that's just the third scenario is the thorn. So these are saved people and these are just saved people that are getting carried away with the cares and riches of pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Verse 15, but, they, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now this is obviously the scenario that is ideal and that everyone should be at, where we are at good ground and we're bringing forth fruit. A couple of thoughts here just on the seed on the good ground. I'm not going to go to the other passages, they're very similar. Um, but one thing I want to say is, you know, fruit can represent several things in the Bible. Like fruit doesn't represent only soul winning. That is one way that we can be fruitful and multiply is to win others to the Lord. We're fruitful when we have children as well. So it's not just the spiritual children. It's also the physical children of being fruitful and multiplying. Um, I do believe as well fruit can represent these things as well. It can represent our words, the things that we say, the fruit of our lips, our lifestyle. You know, when we walk in the spirit, we'll have the fruits of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, and all those things. So it, it represents our life and, and, and the way we conduct ourselves, our conversation. I already touched on soul winning. It also can represent our rewards because there are things that you can do to be fruitful and have rewards in heaven that nobody else sees. You know, you can serve the Lord. You can help out with things. You know, the, 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 the analogy, the example that's always given is when, you know, when you clean the toilet, you know, nobody knows you clean the toilet, but God sees that. You know, it's a job that nobody wants to do, you know, cleaning up, but it's something that God will reward you for. You know, when you do the right thing, even when man does not see it, that will cause you to be fruitful because you'll have the fruit in heaven and the rewards in heaven. So fruit can represent several things, and this is not a sermon about the different types of fruit, but just wanted to give you the different examples. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about, uh, you, know, you know, we talked about, I've talked about the good ground, just, you know, having the right knowledge when we talked about having roots and things like that. But one thing I found interesting that I wanted to bring to your attention here is in verse 15, it says, but, they, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, so obviously there they would have to be saved, uh, and, and, in the, and the good, in good ground, having heard the word, keep it. So there's some obedience there. And bring forth fruit with patience. Now I think it's interesting in the parable of the sower in Luke that it has that little phrase on the end there where it says they bring forth fruit with patience. And, and a thought I just want to give you this morning is, you know, it takes work to bring forth fruit. There's not this automatically you're saved and then you're just automatically with ease just going to be fruitful. It's, it's not easy to live the Christian life. You know, yes, it's easy to get saved. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You don't have to keep the commandments to be saved. But it's hard to keep the commandments. It's hard to keep it, like it says here in verse 15. You hear the word and keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So it's going to take some work. It's going to take some endurance. See, 
Patience in the Bible doesn't just mean you just wait around and just do nothing. Like when we use the word patient, we just say be patient, which means you just wait there and do nothing and then it just eventually comes. That's not how the word patience is used in the Bible. Um, so it's not, there, it's not that there was an absence of persecution and therefore they bore fruit. You know, so it, it, when they bear fruit in, in patience, it's not like things were just going smooth, things were just going easy, everything was going your way, everything's happy and dandy and everything's fine and then you bring forth fruit. No, it's even in the hard times. Even, in, even when things are going rough, even when it's hard to do, they're still bringing forth fruit. This is the mark of bringing forth fruit in good ground. Uh, James 5, 7. It says here, it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So it's saying here, is it saying here that the husbandman is just waiting, is just raining, he's not taking care of anything, and then the, the earth just brings forth fruit? No, because we know that if you don't tend to a garden and you just let the rain go and rain on it, it's just going to bring forth thorns, isn't it? It's going to bring forth weeds. Um, so obviously the husband here, husbandman here is being patient. He's waiting for the precious fruit, but he's a husbandman. I mean, he's looking after this garden. He's doing work. I mean, he's going through the, the sun and the rain, the good times, the bad times, in season, out of season. He's looking after this, this, uh, this place, and then he can wait for that fruit when the rain comes and it brings forth that fruit. In verse 8, it says, Be ye also patient. Establish your heart. So you see there, there's, there's, some, there's, something, there's some work that's happening there. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. You see how those two are closely intertwined. Behold, we count them happy which endure. So you see there's some work and endurance there that goes with, it, with patience. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy you know job's famous words you know when i am tried i shall come forth as gold so he didn't come forth of gold in the absence of tribulation he came forth as gold in the presence of tribulation and in the in the presence of hard times uh galatians 6 verse 7 be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap for he that soweth to his flesh shall also of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And look at this. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Uh, Revelation 13, 7. I just wanted to show you this passage here, just again to show you that patience is not just waiting and doing nothing. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So talking about the Antichrist here. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the word. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So we believe that believers, if, if we live to that point, are going to go through the tribulation. And this is the patience that they have to go. They have to endure and go through the hard times. So when we think about in Luke 8, and we see here that those that are on the good ground, they bring forth fruit in verse 15 with patience. I want you to get that picture in your head that it's not just they're just undisturbed fruit that's just bringing forth fruit. They're going through the hard times. It's going to take work and endurance and then fruit is brought forth in the hard times, not just when things are all going great. And it also shows that fruit doesn't just automatically happen. You know, this thought that people have that if you're just saved, you're automatically going to walk in the Spirit, you're automatically going to be fruitful. Well, why does it take patience? Why does it take hard work? It's just automatic. Do you know what I mean? It's not just automatic. Um, it, takes, it takes somebody to hear the Word to, and to keep it. And then they'll bring forth fruit uh, with patience. So, you know, a couple of things, if you think about it, you know, to be fruitful. You know, fruit requir requires light, doesn't it? You need, you need light, you need nutrients, you need dung, you need pruning. 
and you need time. I mean, spiritually, these things can represent things. You know, light is the truth. So you need the truth to become fruitful. You need to hear the word, right, um, and do it. You need nutrients. Sometimes I think of nutrients might be doctrine, right? Because you, you, don't, you don't just want just food. You need nutritious food. You know, you can't just, you can't just feed plants just nothing, right? They won't grow. They need nutrients. You need some doctrine in there for you to grow. You need some, uh, some so I guess, some, uh, some substance to the things that you're eating. So light, truth, nutrients this can be like doctrine. What about dung? Right, dung causes fruit to grow, but it's not pleasant, in it, is it? And that's like correction. That's like people making you feel uncomfortable. That's throwing a bit of dung on your life so you don't feel comfortable. It'll cause you to change. It'll cause you to be fruitful. Pruning is not comfortable either. What can pr pruning represent? Pruning can be like the purging of the leaves of your life. You know, maybe you've got nothing wrong with leaves in your life. Maybe you've got too many leaves. Maybe those leaves are starting to turn into thorns. And you need to get, you need to get pruned. You need to, you need to feel that pain and you need to feel that, uh, that discomfort to get those vain things out of your life. You know, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let's, let's run forward. So we need some pruning. But the last one, you know, it takes time as well. You know, fruit takes time to grow. So some people get impatient. And you know, time isn't days sometimes. So time isn't weeks. Time isn't even sometimes years. You know, time could mean a lifetime. You know, it takes time to be fruitful in your life. And you're not always going to see all the fruit in the first couple of years. You know, that's why people that go soul winning, they go soul winning once or twice and they're like, oh, soul winning doesn't work, it doesn't do anything. You can't just go once or twice. I mean, can you even go for a year? You know, people go soul winning for a year or two and they go, oh, I didn't get anyone saved. I, I didn't do anything. Well, it's going to take more time than that. And it's not just time as well, right? It's not like you just go soul winning for three years. You, know, you don't learn anything. You don't grow at all. You're not going to be fruitful. These all work together. You know, and that's why God, you know, we look at nature and we see how nature works and we can learn things from it. Because, you know, if all you gave a plant was sunlight, it's not going to give fruit. If all you gave was fertilizer, it's not going to give fruit. If all you gave it was time and none of the other things, it's, it, all these things have to be present um, for you to be as fruitful as you can be. So you need to be willing to invest some time, invest some of your life to, to going soul winning. Uh, and the last thing is, um, we don't see it in this passage. Let's go to one that actually has it. No. Mark 4. It's, I think it's in Mark 4. Um, verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. So the last thought I just had on the good ground is we see there are differing amounts of fruit. And that's okay. You know, it's okay that people are less fruitful than others because God's not comparing everyone with how much fruit as, as an absolute value, right? Because to whomsoever much is given, much more shall be required. And we look at the parable of the tar talents. We look at the parable of the pounds where people are judged according to what they're given and what they do with what they are given. So there are differing amounts of fruit and that's okay. It's not that the 30-fold is worse than the 60-fold and the 100-fold is better than the 60-fold. It's there are just differing amounts because there are differing amounts of fruitfulness in the Christian life. But one thing I will say is, is that if they're on the good ground, there always is fruit. It's not like seed falls on good ground and then there's no fruit. It's like some fell on good ground and some brought forth zero-fold and 30-fold and 60-fold. No, 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 there's always fruit. So th there's got to be some fruit in your life. If, if you're on good ground, otherwise you're not on good ground. Um, but if you're on good ground, you're going to bring forth fruit and don't necessarily compare yourself to other people. You know, just do the best with what you have. That's what God wants you to do. <coughs> and you're going to be rewarded accordingly. Now, just a couple of closing thoughts just on the parable of the sower in general. You know, in all, even though all, all the first three scenarios... Um, no, sorry, the first scenario is, is people that are not saved and the other three scenarios are people that are saved. So even though these latter three scenarios all talk about people that are saved, you know, when it comes to people in our situation, I mean, I think really the, 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 the situation about the thorns, what I talked about today, is really where we're at today. If something is going to make you unfruitful in the society and the culture and in the country that we live in today, it's going to be thorns. Because number one, I mean, hopefully all of us here are saved. Obviously, I believe most of us here are saved. Um, 
If you're saved, obviously the, the first scenario is not going to affect you because if you're saved, you're not a seed that's by the wayside. Um, when you think about the stony ground, what, what stopped the stony ground from being unfruitful? I mean, they didn't know the right things. They didn't have the doctrine. And there was the persecution, the sun that came up and scorched the, the seed. Now, is, is, that really, is that really a scenario that we find ourselves in? You know, yes, you know, okay, persecution might be people making fun of you at work or something like that, or you know, people blocking you on Facebook, right? Um, you know, that, that's about the extent of our persecution. It's like, oh, they defriended me, or they, they, they made a, a nasty comment on some, a status that I, that I posted on Facebook. But, but, you know, when you read about persecution in the Bible, it's actually getting, remember, uh, Paul, it was buffeted, you know. These are people getting beaten up. Their lives are being threatened for, for, the, for the gospel. That's not the sort of persecution um, I think that really uh, we should be concerned about. Yes, is that a reason why people become unfruitful? Yes. But is that something that we, we really struggle with in our day and age? We don't struggle with that sort of persecution. And, and you know, we're in a good church. You know, we, we have the Bible. We know what we believe. We have the doctrine. So the, the stony ground situation is not really something that really sticks to our heart. You know, for us, and even in my own life, I feel, it's going to be the thorny ground. It's the thorn. If, if you're going to become unfruitful, I believe in the situation that we find ourselves in. No persecution, good Bible teaching, you know, in, in a land that is prosperous. It's going to be the thorns, isn't it? So reflect on this morning. What are the thorns in your life? Because... Really, of the three scenarios, or of the two scenarios that's going to make you unfruitful, or the, sorry, the three scenarios, obviously the not being saved, the stony ground, it's going to be the thorns. So whatever the thorns are in your life, you know, fill in the blanks. Don't just think, just, oh, Victor didn't mention it this morning, so that thorn's mine, you know, like I'm just going to keep doing it. No, no, fill in, fill in the blanks. You know, there's a thought, you're probably thinking of a thorn in your life right now. You know, that's the one you've got to get rid of. Because, you know, I may not remind you of the thorn in your life, but I'm sure the Holy Spirit will. The Holy Spirit will bring these things to your remembrance and you'll think of these things, your conscience will convict you. And if you're thinking of a thorn right now, that's the thorn that needs to stop and get out of your life so that you'll be more fruitful. You know, and as believers, another closing thought is, you know, as believers, you know, we go through these, it's, it's not just that you're, if you're a stony ground hero, you're destined to be a stony ground hero, that's the hero that you're ever going to be. No, these are three different scenarios, and obviously we can go through these different scenarios. You know, there are times when we're a thorny, thorny ground here. There are times where we're a stony ground here. And, you know, how many times have you seen people get out of church, but they get back into church. They get back into the faith and they become fruitful. Some people are on good ground. They're fruitful for a while, and then the thorns come, and then they become unfruitful. They get away from doing the right thing. So we can go through these different scenarios, um, but we ought to strive to be somebody that's on good ground. So, so think about this. It says here, No man when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known come abroad, and come abroad. Take heed therefore how ye hear, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. Now, if you didn't realize, these couple of verses come straight after the parable of the sower. So it's interesting that after Jesus explains the parable of the sower, he says a couple of other things, and then he talks about taking heed how you hear and what you do with what you've heard. So Today, you know, don't, don't go, don't, don't leave today, you know, the same person that you came. If there's some things in your life that you know you need to, to change and get rid of, hey, start taking some action to change those things if you, in your life. See, if you do something with what God has given you, God's going to give you more. Sometimes people wonder, oh, you know, how do these people know so much? Or how do these people, uh, you know, know so much about the Bible? Well, it's because if you do things with the things that you are taught from the Bible, God's going to reveal more to you. And it's the same today. Every time you come to church, God reveals things to you. He, he enlightens your heart and He brings things to your remembrance. And if you do something with it, then you're going to move forward. But if you ignore it and don't do anything with it, you're going to be stuck in that same place, struggling with the same th things uh, and being unfruitful because you haven't done anything about it. You know, if you do things with what God has given you, you're not going to be a forgetful hearer. So don't leave today the same as you came. Don't just be a hearer of the word and not a doer so that you don't become a forgetful hearer. 
So hopefully that has been a blessing to you today and just made you reflect on things in your own life. But you know, do something about it. Okay, if there's some thorns in your life, do something about it so that you'll be even more fruitful for the Lord. All right, let's pray.